So 2 Samuel chapter 6. The part of the passage I want to focus in on the beginning of verse 10 where the Bible reads, So David would not <clears throat> would not remove the ark of the Lord unto him and unto this into the city of David. But David carried aside into the house of Obed Edom the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obed Edom the Gittite three months. And the Lord blessed Obed Edom and all his household. And it was told, the, told King David, saying, The Lord hath blessed the house of Obed-Edom, and all that pertaineth unto him, because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with gladness. The title of the sermon this morning is The Blessing of Obed-Edom. The Blessing of Obed-Edom. And what I want to look at um, <clears throat> here specifically is several statements in this passage that we just read there, in beginning of verse 10 that will show us uh, just some statements regarding Obed-Edom and what it was, you know, how he was blessed and why he was blessed and just look and see some of the things that will help us see how Obed-Edom was blessed and how that we also might be blessed as well so that the blessing of Obed-Edom could be said that we were we are blessed as he is that we could be blessed just as Obed-Edom was blessed now of course in this story if you recall the, the back story of the ark here where if, you, you know, if you've been reading through your Bible up to this point, you would know that um, <clears throat> the ark had been taken away um, in the days of uh, Samuel when he was just a boy. That it had been taken by the Philistines and re remained there all of Samuel's life and through the reign of Saul. And now, and now King David is coming on the throne. So the ark of God has been away from Israel for some time. And in the story, David is trying to retrieve the ark from the Israelites, or from the Philistines, excuse me, and bring it back in uh, into the land of Judah. And we know that, of course, that famous story there with Uzzah and Hio. You know, Uzzah reaches out and touches the ark and is slain. And that's where we are in the story here with Obed-Edom. And they turn aside the ark, as it says there, and they go into the house of Obed-Edom and leave the ark there. And while the ark is there, abiding in the house of Obed-Edom, Obed-Edom is blessed. And one of the first things I want us to notice is there in verse 10 where it says, So David would not remove the ark of the Lord unto him into the city of David, but David carried aside into the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. Now, it's very uh, specific here that the Bible mentions that Obed-Edom was the Gittite. It wasn't just Obed-Edom. Now, if you, if you can continue on in your reading, just a few chapters later, there is another Obed-Edom who's mentioned in uh, doing work in the service of God. You know, I believe he was a Levite, and he was, a, well, I believe, one of the singers, if I'm recalling it correctly. But it's very. This is a different Obed-Edom that's mentioned later, um, actually, quite quite quickly after the next few chapters. But it's very specific that it mentions that this Obed-Edom is a Gittite. Not just to distinguish him from the fact that you know, he's not the Obed-Edom that we'll, we'll read about in a few chapters. But I believe more importantly to show us that Obed-Edom, uh, the fact that he was a Gittite, that's very telling. It tells us something. Now you say, well, who, who are the Gittites? Well, if you recall, Gittites throughout the Bible are Philistines. They're one of the, one of the peoples that lived within the land of the Philistines. And to prove that, if you would, to turn over to 2 Samuel, keep a bookmark there in 2 Samuel 6, but we'll be coming back to it looking at several phrases there. But turn over to 2 Samuel chapter 21. 2 Samuel chapter 21. And we're going to look at the fact that the Gittites were Philistines. While you're reading to sec, or turning to 2 Samuel chapter 21, I'm going to read from Joshua 13 where the Bible says, Now Joshua was old and stricken in years, and the Lord had said unto him, Thou art old and stricken in years, and there remaineth yet very much land to be possessed. This is the land that yet remaineth, all the border of the Philistines and all of Geshurai, from Sihor, which is before Egypt, even under the borders of Ekron northward, which is counted to the Canaanite, five lords of the Philistines, the Ga Ga Gazathites, the Ashdodites, the Ashkelonites, and the Gittites. Mm -hmm. So the Gittites we see were of the Philistines. You're there in 2 Samuel chapter 21, and there was a battle, there was again a battle in Gob with the Philistines, where Elhanan, the son of Jeroboam, a Bethlehemite slew the brother, brother of Goliath, the, the Gittite. So, if you recall who Goliath was, Goliath, of course, was the was the champion of Gath, where David slew with with a with a stone. And it says here that Goliath was the Gittite. Now, Goliath, we all know, was a Philistine. So, the point I'm trying to make here at the very beginning of this passage is that God is willing to bless even a Gittite. He's willing to bless Amen. even a Philistine. He's willing to bless. Somebody that in, in, a, in a great deal of passage and many other passages in the scripture would be considered uh, of a people who are the enemy of God. And what we can draw from that is that salvation or having the presence of God in your life or the dwelling of God in your tabernacle. We know that today you know, we are the tabernacle of God. We are the temple of God. And that when we are saved, the Holy Spirit dwells with us. 
And in the Old Testament, here in this passage, we know that the ark is, is, a, is a picture of the presence of God. Yeah. We can see that salvation is something that's available to everybody. Or having the presence of God in your life, the blessing of God in your life, is not something that's just limited to any one group of people. It's right. something that God wants to bestow upon all people. That's right. And if you would, just turn over to uh, second, or excuse me, Romans chapter 3. And I want to just really drive this point home in that Obadiah, or not, excuse me, Obadiah, um, Obed-Edom was a Gittite. And I think this is something that people need to, to, to grasp in Scripture. Because we can see that all the way back in the book of 2 Samuel, God is showing us something, that salvation is free to everybody. And it's the theme throughout all, all of the Bible. And we need to drive, let these things sink in today because we're living in a time when people, different people groups want to claim God all to themselves. Or they want to say that God deals with people, certain people differently than He does other people. Right. But God is consistent. God has always been the same, and we see that here in this passage. You're turning over there to the book of Romans in uh, verse 3. I'm going to read to you some verses. 2 Peter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning His promises, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. How many people does God want to come to repentance? to salvation. He wants everybody to come. 1 Timothy 4 says, For therefore we both labor and suffer and reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men. He is the Savior of all men, the Bible says there in 1 Timothy. And it says, especially of those that believe. So it's not that God is the Savior of only those that, that believe. God died for the sins of the whole world. God wants to be the Savior of all men, but it's only those that believe that will know Him in heaven. Even the people that reject and refuse the Lord Jesus Christ, God is still their Savior. They've just refused it. They've refused that salvation. 1 John 4, And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. That would include everybody. 1 John 2, 2, And He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. That's a great verse that I like to use out so many. To show people that Jesus Christ is the substitute or the propitiation for not just our sins, but for the sins of everybody. We'll ask the question, did Jesus Christ die for some people or everyone? And most people will say, yeah, everybody. And that's a great verse to back that up. To say, yeah, he died for the sins of the whole world. And of course, that great verse that we use often, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son in the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Who is it that God wants to save? He wants to save the world. God wants to save everybody. So we see that how consistent God is in Scripture of wanting people to, all people to be saved, even all the way back in the book of 2 Samuel where Obed-Edom Obed the Gittite is able to receive the presence of God into his tabernacle, into, into his dwelling. Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor. He didn't say, come unto me, specific groups of people. He didn't say, come unto me, only these people, only these people, or only these people. He wants everybody to come unto him. Romans chapter 2, the Bible reads, for there is no respect of persons with God. That's what we can see and, and pull and understand when we read the story of the blessing of Obed-Edom, that God is not a respecter of persons. Right. I mean, he's a Gittite. He's coming from the people that uh, the, the, the children of Israel had been at war with throughout their entire history, ever since they came into the land of Israel, going back and forth and, and battling with these people. But God is willing to allow His blessing to come upon the house of one who, is, uh, who would be considered an enemy of the house of Israel. Because God is not a respecter of persons. Now you're there in Romans chapter 3, and we're going to read from verse 19, where the Bible says, Now we know that whatsoever things the law saith, it saith to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnesses, witnessed by the laws and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all that believe. For there is no difference. Again, Paul here driving in the point that he had made previously in chapter 2, that God is not a respecter of person. Everybody is condemned by the law. Everyone is guilty before God. And that God is, is a, has a, 
and shown His righteousness, which is by faith through Jesus Christ. He's made it available unto all, everybody, and upon all that would choose to believe. So it's not a matter of where our lineage comes from. It's not a matter of our race or ethnicity or our background. It's whether or not we believed. For there is no difference. Now you say, well, what, what can we take away from this? What we can apply? Well, the first application we can make from all this is that Calvinists are a bunch of fools. That people that would say God is selective and who is allowed to be saved and right. who is not. And that flies in the face of Scripture. That's right. And I'm sure that you know, there would be Calvinists that would stand up and, and try to you know, correct us on this doctrine and say, well, you know, I know you've got a plethora of verses and there's many more that I could turn to. That you have all these verses that would seem to say that you know, God is the Savior of all men. Mankind, that God wants everyone to be saved. I mean, it's pretty plain when you read the scriptures. And I'm not, and I'm sure they have a lot of clever ways to dodge the scripture and to explain things away. But if we take the scripture at face value, which is how we ought to read and interpret the Bible, at face value, uh, you know, take it for what it says, then we would see clearly from these, you know, dozen or so verses that I've just read, and the example of scripture going all the way back to Samuel, 2 Samuel 6, that God is the Savior of all men. That God wants all men to be saved. He's not selective, which makes Calvinist look or Calvinism look foolish. Amen. Because it is. And of course, you know, if we were to preach this in, in many Baptist churches, that we get a lot of amens. We get a lot of people that would get on board. You know, we could go to the mainline independent fundamental Baptist church. They'd say, yeah, those those bunch of Calvinists, and we could really rally them up, right? But you know what? Shame, but we could go to a lot of those other ones, and we could say, hey, you know what? We could also take from this is the fact that you know we as Christians should not be supporting just the wholesale slaughter and destruction of foreign peoples. That we shouldn't just be all for, you know, rah, 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 bomb them all, let God sort them out. This kind of just, you know, pro-Israel, anti-everybody else, pro-America, America, anti-everybody else, let's just bomb everybody back in the Stone Age mentality. A lot of these people have in these churches because they have this, this you know, Republican Party platform mindset uh, you know, this political mindset that overrides the clear teaching of Scripture. They're more influenced by a political narrative than they are the narrative of Scripture. And what they're, and what they're willing uh, to do is just see whole peoples wiped out because they just consider them their enemy because they're in another land or they, or they hold to uh, different values or traditions or they're just perceived as their enemy because of the things they're told, you know, on mainstream media and over talk radio. And shame on those, on those Christians who, who don't read their Bibles and see that God wants all men to be saved. You know, rather than sending, you know, all these armed forces over into these foreign countries and just setting up, you know, an empire to take over the world, pretty much is what we're doing, being in 130 plus countries at any given time, maybe we should be sending, again, you know, missionaries. We should be trying to reach those people with the gospel and try to reach out with them instead of, you know, destroying them and taking over their, their, uh, their lands. And that's not a popular message, but that is the, that, I believe that's how God feels about these things. Is that God wants all men to be saved, not all men to just you know, be counted as, as uh, collateral damage. But I'll move on from that point. Under the, and, and the last thing I want us to see here is that you know, what we can take from this is that God wants all men to be saved, meaning He's not picky about who's going to be saved. He doesn't have a preference. He does not going to exalt one people above another. So that would tell us again that you know the blessing of God is not exclusive to any one group of people. And if you would turn over to Galatians chapter three, now I'm sure I wouldn't have to to ask uh, very long. It wouldn't take long for us to come up with an answer if we could say, is there any one group of people that are are seem to get some kind of pass today, especially in Baptist churches? I mean, is there is there a group of people that Baptist pastors get up, or even not, you know, just Christians in general? That would say, well, those people just get a pass. They're just God just has a special blessing on them as reserved for them. They're just exclusive. It doesn't apply to them. You know, they have some kind of special treatment. They're just the VIPs of God. You know, they've got their own special parking spot up in heaven. I mean, we would all know who we're talking about, wouldn't we? The modern day nation of Israel. You know, the Jews of today. A lot of people just treat them that they just get some kind of pass with God. That they that God has just some you know totally different way of dealing with them. But that's just not the case. And if you look there in Galatians chapter 3, verse 7, the Bible says, Know ye therefore, they which are of faith are the same, the same are the children of Abraham. So who are the children of Abraham? Anybody who's of faith. They are the children of Abraham. Right. And people say, well, the children of Israel, you know, the, the Jews that we know today, 
and say, well, they're the children of Abraham. And that's a stretch by a long, that's a very long stretch to say that those are the descendants of Abraham. You know, that's a whole other sermon to go into. But even if they were, and they're not, let's just give them that pass, you know, we're, we are the children of Abraham. Every bit as much as anybody who could lay claim to the, you know, the physical genealogy of Abraham, we are as every much, every bit a child of Abraham as they are. Verse 8, And the Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, <coughs> <coughs> preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, And these shall one nation be blessed. Just the nation of Israel. That's it. Right? No, it says all nations. All nations. I mean, you name the nation, they'll be blessed if they believe the, the, the faith that is preached through Abra faithful Abraham. So then we see, verse 9, that they which are of faith are blessed with a faithful Abraham. For as many as are the works of the law are under the curse of the law, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in this book of the law to do them. But no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident. For the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Verse 14, That the blessing of Abraham might come unto the Gentiles through Jesus Christ that we might receive the promise of spirit through faith. So we see that the promise of, 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 of spirit through faith is come unto us. Even Gentiles, even those who are outside the house of Israel, even, even those that are foreigners to the nation of Israel, are ever, can lay claim every bit to be a child of Abraham because of the fact that salvation is by grace through faith. Right. That it's something that God extends towards all men, not just one group of people. So we see, first of all, in the blessing of Obed-Edom, is that Obed-Edom was a Gittite. He was a Philistine. He was somebody that would be, had, could potentially even gone to war at one point. Maybe even his, his daddy and granddaddy had some old war stories when they fought the, the, you know, the children of Israel back in the day. But God is long-suffering to us who are not willing that any should perish. And we can see here that it doesn't matter where you come from or who you are. God will bless you. God wants you and can bless you. The next thing I want to look at there, in verse 11, go back to 2 Samuel chapter 6. 2 Samuel chapter 6. It says in verse 11, And the ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months. So he gets a specific time frame, right? It says it continued there three months. And of course the story goes on. We know, we know why it only continued there three months is because David came back and took it and did things the right way. But I, I can't help but think that if that had dwelt, if it had gone on even longer, that, that time period would have been longer. If, if, if David had taken six months, it said it would have dwelt there six months. It would have stayed there, and the blessing of God upon Obed-Edom's house would have stayed there the entire time that, that it was there, that the ark was there. Why is that? It's because God's blessing is sustainable. God is not, you know, we're talking about the blessing of salvation. And I think Christians today, they sell themselves short a lot of times with the blessing of God. We, we get saved and we're, when we're excited about that. And that's, of course, the greatest blessing of all. That salvation is by grace through faith that we can just be saved freely by no merit of our own. That God extends you know, mercy and grace towards us through Jesus Christ. That if we just believe on Him, we can have eternal life with Him in, in, in heaven. That's, that's a great blessing. But it doesn't stop there. The blessing of God is something that, that we can experience and know even in our, our life here on this earth. As, you know, while we're living our life here, we can know the presence and the blessing of God. As it says there, Obed-Edom knew it for, for three months. You know, he was blessed of God for those three months, showing us that when God is dwelling in us, when God is dwelling with us, we are blessed of God. And that, that's not just a one-time blessing. But it's something that can be sustained. That blessing is something that continues on over time. It's not just one, one blessing. There's several different blessings that we could talk about this morning that come into our lives. You know, the Bible says, you know, that the, the children are the heritage of the Lord. That children are a blessing to us. It's not just that all of our children, but each one of our children in their own way is a blessing unto us. And there's many other blessings that we could talk about. But what I want to just drive in right now is show us that God wants to bless us, and that He wants to bless us for the long haul. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 3, I'll, I'll read to you, 
Ephesians 3, For this cause I bow, bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. He's saying here, you know what? God is able to bless you more than you could ever imagine. You know, and I, I think we kind of shy away from this sometimes as you know, independent Baptists because we don't want to be lumped in with these prosperity preachers. You know, I mean, you take one look at my finances and you'll know that's just not the case, you know. But is that to say just because, you know, I've, I've got, I don't have the full bank account because I drive a used car, you know, because I live in an apartment that I'm not blessed of God, that somehow the blessing of God is only evident if I'm driving, you know, a brand new car, I've got a car, my wife's got a car, I've got all the new clothes and taking the vacations, we live in the big house. Is that really the blessing of God? All this just material wealth and abundance? That's not the blessing of God. I mean, God could bless a person that way. And I'm sure there's out there that would give God the glory for all the, the great things that He's allowed them to have on this earth. But that's not the limit of it. I mean, we, that's not how we should measure the blessing of God. Amen. But we shouldn't shy away from, from, from saying things like, well, God is able to do exceeding above and abundantly above all that we ask or think. I think we sell ourselves sell ourselves short of the blessing of God because we think, well, you know, God doesn't want to overdo it with me. You know, God doesn't want to give me too much. I shouldn't ask for more than I think I, I deserve or, or, or want. Or I shouldn't ask too big of a thing from God. But God wants us you know, to challenge Him or to, to, in the sense that, you know, say, see what I can do. You know, ask, you know, and, and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. God wants to open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing upon us. You know, it's just that too often we associate, associate that with finances. You know, a lot of people want to just say, well, that just must mean some material abundance. But what about an abundance of souls? What if we were to go out and do a great work for God and say, God, bless the work and the effort that we're going to put forth you know, in starting churches and, and doing soul winning marathons and, and reaching the, the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I mean, we should be asking God to bless that. We should be asking and crying out that God would do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. You know, I love the, the Pastor Anderson's mentality that he has, the vision that he has. It's a big vision. It's a large vision, but it's God's vision. That's the vision that God has. He wants to show us how much he can bless us because the blessing of God is sustainable. It's something that can last through a lifetime. And it's something that can come in abundance. As it says there for Obed-Edom, it's something that dwelt in his house for three months, showing us that the blessing of God is something that is sustainable and something that happens over a lifetime. It's not just a one-time thing. And that's the that's the next point of my pain is that God wants to bless us over a, a, a lifetime. He doesn't want to just hit us once and say, "Well, there you go. That's all the blessing you're going to get." That there's that God wants to bless us throughout our whole life. And the Bible says in Psalm one one thirty three, I'll read for you a song of degrees of David. Behold, how good and pleasant, and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard that went down to the skirts of his garments, as the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descended upon the mountain, mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. You see there, when God commands the blessing, when He can, commands it, He commands it forevermore. He commands the life forevermore. God wants to, wants to bless us forever. Deuteronomy 6. And if you would turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy 6 says in verse 1, Now these are the commandments and the statutes and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you that you might do them in the land where you go to possess it. That thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy sons, did, sons all the days of thy life that thy days may be prolonged. So God wants our days to be prolonged. God wants to bless us all the days of our life. God wants to bless us, our sons, and our sons' sons. God wants the blessing of God to be a multi-generational blessing, one that extends far beyond just the blessing of salvation. God wants to bless for, for a lifetime. And not only that, as it says there, thou and thy sons and thy sons' sons, we see that God wants to bless even our children. That's how great and big the blessing of God is. He wants to bless even the next generation to come. 
as it says there in uh, your Deuteronomy 30, but I'll remind you what it says back in in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 6. It says uh, in verse 11 that the uh, the uh, the ark continued in the house of Obed Edom the Gittite three months, and the Lord blessed Obed Edom and all his household. So even those that were members of his house, it wasn't just, just Obed Edom, but it was those around him. It was family, it was it was those that worked with him, it was you know, perhaps he had servants, but anybody that was associated with his household was also blessed because of the blessing that came upon Obed Edom. And that shows us here that God wants to bless those around us. And specifically, we you know, we could apply it today that God wants to bless our children. If you're there in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 15. The Bible reads, See, I have set before thee this day life and good, death and evil, and that I command thee this day to, to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commands and his statutes and his judgments, that thou, was may, that thou mayest live and multiply. And the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. But if thine heart turn away, so, shalt thou, so, shalt, so that thou wilt not hear, but shall be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them. I denounce unto you this day that ye shall surely perish, that ye shall not prolong your days upon the land, whether ye pass, passest over Jordan to go to possess it. I call heaven and earth to record against you this day, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live, that thou mayest love the Lord thy God, and thou mayest obey his, his voice, and that thou mayest cleave unto him, for he is thy life and the length of thy days that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord, thy the Lord swear to thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. So we see here that you know it was blessing was set before them, that if they do obey God, that they and their seed would live. And that's really, I mean, the whole story of the children going into the promised land and possessing it is a story of obedience. It's a story of them, you know, over and over and over again, we see passages like this pertaining to that story where he's saying, look, you have to obey me. You have to keep my commandments. You have to do my statutes. You have to walk in my judgments. And if you do that, I will bless you, you and the generation to come. And that's what we see, that going back and forth. They, they, they follow the commandments of God and they're blessed. They go out of the way they, and they're cursed. And it goes back and forth, back and forth. But if we would, if we would keep God's commandments, that God, God will bless us, and not only just us, but those around us, as he did Obed-Edom. He would bless our household. He would bless even our seed, as it says there. So we see that God wants to bless everybody, not just one group of people. As it says, obed Edom was a Gittite. He wants to bless everybody. And not only that, but he, wants to, he wants to bless even the, our whole household. You know, there's that residual effect of the blessing that comes upon us to those around us. You know, when, when we're blessed, others will be blessed with us in our household. And, and it, you know, it comes through obedience. There's that famous saying that I've heard several preachers, preachers say, and I think it's a good one to keep in mind, that the path of blessing is through the door of obedience. I mean, that is the, the story that, you know, the, the moral of the story about the children of Israel, that if they were to, to dwell long in the land and have the blessing of God upon them, that they had to obey the commandments and the statutes of God. And nothing's changed. You know, salvation, of course, is free. Salvation is not about, you know, us working our way to heaven. That's something that's freely given up to us. You know, it's by being born again. You know, my child, none of my children had put forth any effort in being born. You know, that just happened. They didn't have any say in the matter. You know, they were, they, they, they were born. But if they want the blessing of Dad upon their lives, you know, then they have to obey and keep my commandments. They have to keep my statutes. They have to keep the rules that I set up in my house. And when they step out of line, there's, there's consequences for, for breaking those rules. And it's the same way with us and God. You know, once we're born into God's family, we're always His child. But if we want the blessing of God in our life, then we have to obey and keep His commandments. Notice also there in 2 Samuel verse six, chapter 6 and verse 12. 2 Samuel chapter, chapter 6. So again, we've seen Obed, that Obed and Edom was a Gittite. And God is, wants to bless everybody. We've seen also that the, the, that the, the ark continued the house of Obed and Edom the Gittite for three months. God's blessing is sustainable. He can do more than we think. And that the Lord blessed Obed Edom and all his household. That God wants to bless us even beyond our own lives into the next generations if we'll obey and keep his commandments. But notice there in verse 12 it says, And it was told King David, saying, The Lord hath blessed Obed Edom, the house of Obed Edom. So somebody at some point, you know, came to the king, came to King David and said, Hey, 
Obed Edom's being blessed, man. And things are going really well for him. Ever since we put that ark in there, when we're bringing it back, he's just being blessed. It was told him. Somebody came and told him about it. And what we can take from that is God's blessing is obvious. And a lot, not maybe not always, but we can see here that generally speaking, that we can look at somebody's life. If we get to, when we get to know people, we could say, you know, that person is blessed of God. We could, we could, others could say that of us. Wow, that person's really blessed. God's blessing is something I, I believe that is obvious. You know, and a lot of people say, yeah, it's obvious because I got all these gold chains and all these gold rings and I got all these fancy cars and I got this big mansion. You know, but even the wicked have that. Even the most, I mean, you look at the wealthiest people on earth, and I, I guarantee you they're probably some of the worst, just worst people on earth. Amen. The most vile, yeah. wicked people with the most evil intentions. I mean, you look at a guy like Bill Gates. I mean, who just wants to, I mean, I, and here's, the, you want to hear something scary. He's actually building. He bought, I think, 25,000 acres or something like that, just west outside of Phoenix, not too far from here, where he's going to build a smart city, you know, a fully automated city. And, you know, who knows what that, I just read this article that just came to mind. I don't know what it has to do with the sermon, but look into that. <laughs> so the point I'm trying to make is that Bill Gates, you know, he does a lot of things that I consider wicked. Oh, absolutely. You know, that he's into eugenics. He wants to vaccinate everybody, you know, and, yeah. he's, and he does it all in this guise of charity. Right. And uh, he's just a wicked man. And other people, I mean, you look at a guy like uh, George Soros, just, you know, billions of dollars, millions of dollars. I, I don't know what he's worth, but he's a very wealthy man. And he does a lot. He has. He uses that that money to do a lot of evil and wicked things. Yeah. Do you really think that all that money is there because of the blessing of God? You know, we can look at that guy and say that guy is not blessed of God. That guy's you know split hell wide open. There's several people that we could say that about. But the blessing of God, I believe, is something that's obvious in a Christian's life. It's something that we can look at another Christian and say he is being blessed of God. As it says here, it was told of Obed Edom to the king. It was told him, hey, he's he's blessed. What did they say? They said, the Lord hath blessed the house of Obed-Edom. I mean, how would they know that if it wasn't obvious? Did they take a survey? Did they go back to Obed-Edom? How are things going? Oh, you're blessed? Oh, let me go tell the king. No, it was obvious that they were to look at Obed-Edom and what was going on in his life. I mean, think of other stories in the scripture of, of like uh, of Jacob. You know, we told Laban, you know, I know that the Lord hath altogether blessed thee because of me. You know, when, when Laban's flocks began to multiply and he started to have all that wealth, you know, Jacob knew who, why it was there. It was because the blessing of God was upon him. And again, you know, Laban was just a benefactor. He just got to experience some of the residual effects of that blessing. So God's blessing is something that's obvious. You know, we could we probably even think of people that we know in our churches, of people that we know, of Christians that we know, that we could say, well, that person is blessed. Like I referred to earlier, you know, we see people, children, uh, people with large families. Or even small ones, even people that are, are being faithful and multiplying. You know, they're not trying to hinder the the multi, you know of, of bearing fruit. They're not doing anything to to, uh, to stop that. And there's some they're happy people. They're pleasant people to be around. Right. They have joy. They have peace in their life. Yeah. They might not have all the, the nicest things, but they have you know they have the real blessings that matter in life. They have children. They have love. They have a Bible that they love. They have friends and family. That those are the blessings of God that that that, that matter. That God gives us. And we can we can look at people that have that and say they are blessed. That is what it means to have the blessing of God in your life. It's not necessarily financial or material gain. It's having things of, of true substance, of spiritual substance. Those are the, are the obvious blessings of God. And that's you know, Jesus said in Matthew 5, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. I mean, God, God wants our good works to be seen. And how are we going to do any good work if we're not blessed of God? Yeah. You know, I mean, if we're, if we're walking against the commandments and, 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 the, and the statutes of God, of course we're not going to be doing the works of God. But if we do the good works, why? That others may see it. God wants the blessing of God to be seen in our lives. Psalm chapter 34. If you would turn to Psalm chapter 34, I'll be turning there real quick. It was told King David that the, the house of Obed-Edom was being blessed. God's blessing is obvious. It's something that we can see in the lives of Christians. <clears throat> Psalm 34, verse 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. He wants us to see it. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. So how do you see that the Lord, the Lord is good when you see a blessed man? And how is a, a, how is a blessed man blessed when he trusts in God? So it's the man that trusts in God that is blessed 
And that's what we are to look to, to see that the Lord is good. Hopefully that wasn't too confusing. <laughs> <laughs> so, but trust and see, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed, in the man that, blessed is the man that trusteth in Him. Verse 9, Oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear Him. The young lions do lack and, so, and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. Come, ye children, hearken unto me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is he that desireth life and loveth many days, that he may see good? And that's a good question. Who is it that would want to see many days? Who would, that would loveth many days? That would desire life? Who would, who would want to see good in their life? Who would want the blessing of God in their life? I mean, is there anybody out there that really would say that would pass on that? If I were to come to you and offer you the blessing of God in your life, if I were to come to you and say, hey, God wants to bless you, you can have it, it's available to you, I'll pass. Now, strangely enough, there's people that pass on salvation, that blessing. Yeah. You know, but if we were to come to them and say, hey, you know, do you, want, do you want God to help you with that addiction? Do you want God to help you to get over that vice in your life? Do you want God to help you to get over that sin in your life? Do you want God to help you you know, prosper in your life, to, do, to be a good employee, to be a good employer, to be a good husband, a good wife, a good child, a good mother, a good father? Do you want God to bless you? Do you want God to help you to see good and to, and to love life in many days? Do you want that in your life? If we were to offer that, who would really turn that away? I mean, the world often wants that, but the problem is, is they don't want what it takes. Right. They want to do what it takes. I mean, we th you think about, I don't know how, my wife's always telling me about, which, you know, I'll brag on my kids a little bit here. You know, they, they go out shopping. My wife say, you know, we got so many, we got these compliments today. And she tells me just about every time they go out, your children are so well behaved. Yeah. And I, I'm sure there's other parents here that could say the same thing about their children. Their children are very well behaved. How do you do that? And these people, it's like a mystery to them. How does that happen? You know, wow, what are you doing? It's like, well, let me tell you, you probably don't want to do what it takes to get the kids to act like that. <laughs> you probably don't want to have to come down on them and, and crack, you know, crack down on them at home or, or take them out to the van. You know, and it's not something you have to do constantly, but you have to get that message through their head that this is how it operates. This is how we do things in this house. And once they start to understand the consequences of being good and being bad, you know, things fall into place. But there is a season there of training. You know, we have to train up these children in the nurture and mission of the Lord. So people look at, you know, the blessing of, of well-behaved children, but they'll say, well, if you told them what it really took to get that. Everyone wants the fruit, but no one wants to go out, you know, and, and do the pruning and do the, the, the planting and the weeding and everything that it takes to get that fruit. So we see, you know, it says there, what man is he that desireth life and loveth many days that he may see good? Who is it? You know, who would refuse that? Keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. So it's not just if you want to see good. Who wants to see good? Well, just ask for it. No, there's some, there's some requirements that come along with it. And what we can see is that though God wants His goodness to be in our lives to be obvious, though God wants the blessing to be obvious in our lives, we still have to understand something that the blessing of God is conditional. Now, salvation is not conditional. We all understand that. Now, salvation is a free gift. The only condition upon it is whether or not you believe whether or not you choose to put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ or not. But as a child of God, if you want to have the blessing of God in your life, you have to understand that there is a certain, there are conditions laid upon you. That you can't just you know, live however you want and expect the blessing of God to come upon you. Right. Now you can live however you want if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and still go to heaven. Amen. And there's people that don't like that message. Yep. There's people that don't want to hear that. And I'm sure there's probably people on YouTube that are going to hear me say that and try to call me out and call me a heretic or something like that for saying that you can believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and live like the devil and go to heaven. But that's the message of Scripture. That you can do that. That salvation is a free gift. It's not of works lest any man should boast. You know, not by our righteousness, but by His righteousness we're saved. Right. You know, our righteousness is our filthy rags before Him. You know, Jesus Christ became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. We are made the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. So we understand that salvation is a free gift. And no matter what we do, we can't lose it. But that's not a reason for us to go out and, and to live however we want. We shouldn't. And if that's our heart, intent, and motive, you know, the, the, you know we have a wicked heart. Yeah. We're still in the, in the, in the, in the, the gall of iniquity. You know, we're still in that bond. We should desire to go out and, and serve God because of what He's done for us. Not because we're trying to work our way to heaven. Right. So the point I'm trying to make here is that if you want the blessing of God in your life, 
You ha it's conditional. You have to. Yes. There's certain things that you know you have to behave a certain way. You just can't go out and run amok. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm saved now, so I can just you know be a drunk and not expect any consequences. That's not the case. You know, if you're saved, you can still be a drunk, but God's still going to let you suffer the consequences. You know, God, you know, comes down hard on drunkenness in the Bible, yeah. and fornication, and adultery, and all these things that people let themselves get into, even as Christians, even as born again children of God. And you should get no as no surprise to those people that allow themselves to fall into those sins when the when the the hammer of God comes down, the curse of God comes down. When the you know when God starts to judge and punish and, and ch chastise them in their lives, <laughs> and if you would turn over to Hebrews chapter twelve, because this is something that really I, I, I want to drive home. Last week I was out soul winning, and the one guy that I had gave me the time of day to talk to, he really choked on this. You know, I said, "Yeah, you can believe and go to heaven, no matter what you do." You know, and when he was like, well, aren't there some people that, you know, isn't there anything you could do that would keep you out of heaven? I said, well, there's, you know, I tried to explain the reprobate doctor to me. Well, it's not so much that, you know, those people do those things and then they're kicked out. They're, then they're disbarred from heaven. Then they can't be saved. It's because, you know, they, they get to a certain point where God rejects them and then they fall into those sins. I'm trying to explain, you know, people get that switched around, it seems like. But I, I try to explain to them, look, you can be saved by, by grace through faith and go to heaven and live how you want, but there's going to be, a, there's going to be chastising, a chastisement in your life. And that's very clearly taught here in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5, where it says, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom, he, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. So if you're his son, if you're God's child, you know, you're not perfect. There's going to be something that God's probably going to have to deal with in your life. There's going to be some scourging. There's going to be some chastening. I mean, that's just God trying to get you to do right. That's God trying to work you know, work you towards being a, a better child of God, being, uh, serving Him even better. If ye endure chastening, God deal with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? Does any, does any of us that are fathers, do we ever have a child that we just never had to chasten that child? They were just perfect from day one, never had to rebuke them, never had to chasten them, never had to deal with anything. We just, man, just picture perfect. There was only one person that I could have probably ever said that, and it was the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's because He was God. And um, that, you know, I don't want to go off on a tangent there, but the point we're trying to make here is that every child of God is going to receive some chastening. Because every child of God... You know, there's, there's things in our life that we have to get right if we want the blessing of God. Verse 9, Furthermore, we have had fa fathers of our f flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection of the Father of lights and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Amen. You say, I want that. I want the peaceable fruit of righteousness. I want that in my life. I want that blessing, that, that peace, that righteousness in my life. Well, there's some requirements there. God's blessing is conditional. And it just might be that God has to chasten you a little bit. That God has to correct you. That God has to straighten us out on some things so that He could bless us. So we see that the blessing of God is conditional. And I'm running out of time here, so let me just wrap up these, these last couple of points. So we saw back there in, in 2 Samuel chapter 6 that, and if you would turn, stay in Hebrews, but turn over to uh, chap, uh, Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. So we saw that, you know, uh, Obed Eden was a good type. God's blessing is for everybody. We saw that, uh, it, that the, the ark abode in his house for three months. You know, God's blessing is sustainable. And that uh, the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. God wants you know, to bless even our children and, the, and our sons' sons after us. We saw that it was told to King David that the Lord had blessed Obed-Edom. God wants his blessing to be obvious to others. But lastly, uh, we'll see also, it says there in verse 12, And it was told unto King David, saying, The Lord hath blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that pertaineth unto him because of the ark of God. So notice that last phrase. Why was he blessed? Because of the ark of God. Because of God. That's why he was blessed. So the last thing I want to really drive home here is that, oh, that, that, that it's because of God that we're blessed. Meaning this, that God is the source of all blessing. That any, any blessing that we have is from God. 
as it says in James, you're probably familiar with verse uh, one, chapter one, verse sixteen. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variable nor shadow of turning. So we see that every blessing, every good gift, every perfect gift is from God. God is the source of all blessing. So that's why we have to get on His program. That's why we have to make sure we're right with God if we want the blessing of God. You're there in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus, and the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. All spiritual blessings are, are come from God. God is the source of all blessing. <clears throat> Meaning this, that if you want the blessing of God, it's conditional because God is the source of all blessing. Meaning this, that you have to be right with God in order to be blessed of God. That's how you're blessed of God. You have to be right with Him. Psalm 24, I'll read to you. A psalm of David, the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend to the hill of, God, hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul in vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Who is it that's going to receive the blessing? The one who has a pure heart, clean hands, who has not lifted up his soul into vanity. You know, the one who's walked in the statutes and the commandments of, and the judgments of God. He's the one that's going to have the blessings of God upon his life and upon the lives of his children and his children's children. Proverbs 28 says, A faithful man shall abound with blessings. Not an inconsistent man. Not an unfaithful man. Not a man who's wishy-washy, a man who's half in, half out. A man who's driven with the, the, wave, the wind, you know, like the waves of the sea. But it's a faithful man. It's the steady man. It's the man who's you know, endeavoring to, to continue to do the things that God would have him to do, that's the man that's going to abound with blessings. You know, I can't help but wonder when they, when they bring, I love this story in here, and I, I've thought about it often. Um, you know, whenever I read I think about the fact, like, what, what was that scene like when they brought that ark to Obed, Obed-Edom's house? You know, I, I believe Obed-Edom was ready and able to welcome the presence of God into his house. I mean, he, it was an unexpected visit. It was not what they intended. You know, they wanted to bring it all the way back to Jerusalem. That's where they wanted the ark. But along the way, you know, Uzzah puts out his hand. He's slain. They get in a panic. They didn't know what to do. Where do we do with this thing? Uh, go over to that house, knock on the door, tell them we're going to put that thing in there. So all of a sudden, someone's knocking on his door and saying, hey, we got the ark of God. You know, and he's a Philistine. He's probably heard of the, the horror stories that happened to the men back in, I can't remember where it was. No, it's not coming back to me. But you know the story where they, where they first took it, you know, and they got the emeralds and secret places, and uh, they had the plagues and the famine and all that, and they, they're like, get rid of this thing, you know? So obed was kind of like, oh, man, you know, the ark's showing up. But I believe he was ready to receive it, you know, and he welcomed the presence of God into his life. He welcomed the ark of God into his house, and he was, he was ready to receive it. You know, I, I don't think Obed Edom was probably. I mean, did he have to like tear down all the idols first? You know, and I, and I just think about the application being, you know, what things would we have to get right in our house if Jesus were to stop by? If we had a knock at the door one day and it was the Lord, you know, showing up and wanted to talk with us, He wanted to dwell with us for three months. You know, would we have what? You know, what what channels would we have to make sure we didn't turn to on our TV? And maybe we just took the TV down and got rid of it. That'd probably be the best thing to do, right? Or what, what magazines would we have to take off the coffee table? You know, what would we have to put away the ashtray, dump out the liquor first? You know, what things would we not would we be embarrassed to have found out in our house if God were to stop by? If God were to come over and say, hey, let me check out your, you know, your web search history. Let me check out, you know, what 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 you've got going on in your house. What 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 is that we would be not wanting God to see if he were to come by? That was why Obed Edom was ready, was able to be blessed. I believe on a moment's notice, out of nowhere, the ark was coming over. The presence and blessing of God was coming into his life, and he was able to receive it. And that's that's how we can also see that the blessing of God is conditional. If we want the blessing of God in our life, we have to be have a clean heart and pure hands. We can't lift up our soul in a vanity. We have to be ready to receive the blessing of God. That that God can come in and dwell with us and bless us abundantly. 
And I believe that's the message that we can, we can take from, from the story of Obed-Edom. That it's, a, it's something that God wants to give to everybody, that blessing. That he was a Gittite. And that it's something that you know, he got, wants to sustain throughout our lives as he was there with Obed-Edom for three months. And it's something that he wants to do for those even around us in our lives. He wants us, others, to be blessed by our blessing. You know, our children will be blessed by the fact that we are being faithful and obedient to God. And he's blessing us. And he wants that blessing to be obvious. He wants others to be able to see our lives and say, you know, that person is blessed of God. They've got, you know, there's something about their life that is appealing. You know, that's not just this drudgery that we're going through. I think it's too often as Christians, they go, you know, they, all they dwell about all the things that God doesn't want them to do. <laughs> all the things I can't get to do. You know, if I do that, God's going to be mad at me. But they forget, they fail to see all the, the great and good things that God wants to give them. And it's for our own good that God, you know, puts certain things off limits. Amen. Yeah. And, you know, it's, and we have to understand ultimately that all the blessing that we have, as it says, it was because of the ark of God, that it, God is the source of that blessing. And therefore, if we want the blessing of God, we have to be able to receive God Himself, to receive His Spirit into our lives. Now I'll just close by reading 1 John 3, where it says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. You know, what a great love that God has bestowed upon us. You know, as it says that, you know, in uh, 1 Corinthians, you know, um, God, or, uh, how's it go? I'm drawing a blank now. Uh, God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ loved us. That was Romans 5. <laughs> 5 8. So, you know, what manner of love? You know, God commended his love. God's love is greater than anybody else's love. And that he bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. And the Bible says in verse 3 And every man that hath this hope purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Now, if we want the blessing of God and we want the presence of God, we have to be ready to receive it as Obed Edom was. We have to make sure that our lives are right, that God begins to, be to bless us and not to chasten us as is taking place in the background. So, <laughs> that said, let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, again, thank you for the story of Obed Edom. Thank you that, Lord, you've shown us that even all the way back um, in, in, in 2 Samuel, you were ready to bless, Lord, strangers and foreigners to the house of Israel, that your, your blessing and your salvation is available to all them that would believe. And Lord, that it's a blessing that would sustain all of our lives and those around us. And Lord, that if we would just recognize that all good and great things, all the, the perfect things come down from you. And Lord, that if we would then just uh, purify our own hearts and our lives, Lord, that you could pour out a, a blessing upon us and do abundantly more than we could ask or think. Lord, I pray you just be with us as we go our, our separate ways and bring us back again next week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.